Hello. On this Feast of Candlemas, I thought it would be nice to share a few thoughts and reflections. And I'm going to base these on the Gospel that's set for Candlemas, which is St Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. Uh, if you haven't read it recently, it might be a good idea just to pause the video for a moment uh, and to read those uh, words for yourself. And I want to focus really on the two uh, minor characters, not so minor in fact, but the two minor walk-on parts, uh, the characters that appear in this story and then not again in Luke's account. We have Simeon and Anna, who are both found at the temple when the Holy Family go there. And I think it's very interesting the way Luke often uses these, these walk-on characters to uh, further the agenda, if you like, of his gospel. He's keen to show us that uh, the gospel is for everyone, for Jew and Gentile alike, and particularly for the marginalised. And he introduces these two characters um, both for what they have to say and do in the story, but also, I think, to encourage us. And we need encouraging now amidst this dreadful pandemic. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from uh, when we look at this story that's relevant to us today. So I'd like to consider both of the characters, Anna and Simeon in turn, say a little bit about them in context, and then just reflect briefly on how their stories, how their lives and their actions might resonate for us today. Perhaps we can start with Anna who is actually described as a prophet. And this is something that's interesting about the two of them. They are really a meeting point between the Old Testament and the New. They are, if you like, characters from the old world who are welcoming in the new. And Anna, described as a prophet, and Simeon really uh, taking the same role, are um, two of the last prophets to come before Jesus. We're familiar with seeing uh, John the Baptist as the final prophet, the final herald, and these two really are the ones just before him in history. We know that Anna sadly was widowed early in her marriage after seven years, and she spent long years alone by the sound of it. She spends her time devoted in the temple as a woman worshipping God and focusing uh, on the temple worship and her own private devotions over those long years. She's described as always being at the temple. Certainly, clearly, that was a big part of her routine, her daily routine and observance. And she's described as participating in worship through prayer and fasting, those things which Jesus himself commends in the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. When she sees the Holy Family, she's full of praise and she speaks out to those around uh, about Jesus. Uh, perhaps that's a natural thing to do anyway with a new baby. Everyone's very excited and, and they want to share the good news and show off the baby and so on. But she is evangelising effectively because she's not only saying here is a, a lovely new baby, but she recognises that here in this child, God is acting through bringing his Messiah into our world. And similarly, uh, Simeon, uh, again an aged man, He's described as righteous and devoted, and he's looking for the consolation of Israel. He has an understanding that God is going to act to bring um, history forward, if you like, to an important point. We're told that like uh, Anna, he responds to the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is, is within him and resting on him and guiding him so that what he says in this account is not merely accidental. It's something which comes out of his living relationship with God. And he experiences this revelation. Like Anna, he recognises that Jesus is the long-awaited Christ, the Messiah. And in fact, for Simeon, this has an extra dimension because he's received this inner assurance that he will not die until he's seen in, with his own eyes the Messiah. And his wonderful uh, hymn or poem, we call it the Nunc Dimittis these days, um, or we did in Latin days, perhaps we don't so much these days, but his, his wonderful song and prayer is, is glorious both in its recognition of God at work, but also in his willingness to be let go, to let lease of his life, uh, to offer it back to God at its conclusion. He has seen all he needs to see. God's promise has been fulfilled and Simeon knows that he can die in peace uh, with a sense of fulfilment. 
So both of these characters are wonderfully rich in their religious life, in their devotion. Yet, in a sense, they come across as representing the ordinary people. And Luke is very good at this, drawing ordinary people into the story. He doesn't want them, as it were, not to represent you and I. They are rooted in the same world as you and I, perhaps more faithful than we are sometimes in their, in their worship and, and in their prayer. But they are people in touch with God on a simple, basic, fundamental, but very lively and enriched level. So what is it about these characters that we can draw upon today uh, in our uh, lives, in our worship, but perhaps in particular against this background of the ongoing pandemic? I think there are many things um, that we can draw for encouragement and example uh, in the way they have lived and the way they live in this brief uh, uh, account in Luke. And the first thing is, as I've touched on, they are rooted in the experience of faith, the, the Jewish faith, which had been uh, at the centre of their lives. And they stand for that whole uh, expectation of God at work, which we see going back to the prophet Isaiah. Uh, we're aware of as we read our Christmas stories or the, the approach to Christmas in Advent. They, too, are living in that era of expectation, of faithful waiting for God to fulfil his promises. So they're very genuinely rooted in a knowledge and understanding of how God has worked in the past and indeed what he's promised, his faithfulness and, and the way in which that can be replicated in their own day. And therefore they are alert, I think, to God's activity in the present. In a sense, we need to have um, an awareness of history fully to understand God at work in our lives. Um, it's part of a continuum the same uh, faithful God working in our lives. And it's through their links with the past, they can understand what God is doing here and now in bringing forward his promised Messiah. And as well as past and present, there is the future dimension, the, the hope, the faithful expectation for the future. They, after all, are only seeing the very beginning of Jesus' earthly life. They are not going to be around for his adult life and ministry but they have this faithful expectation that God will work in this child and through this child. Uh, and that is what fills them with joy and, uh, in a sense, with a, a relief, um, a, a, a recognition that God has acted as he's promised. They witness then the beginning, if you like, of the, this era of salvation history. Um, they recognise that God is, is doing something. And as I say, they are content simply to be witnesses of the beginning. And that, I think, is something that we can hold on to when life feels very fragile, perhaps particularly at the moment. We always want to feel that we're going to be there for the next stage, whether it is watching our friends and family develop, children growing up or grandchildren growing up. Um, we have this yearning to see how the story unfolds in the future. Yet we know that such is, is the way of life, that we can never um, last to see everything unfold in the future. And it's a matter of faith, actually, to recognise our mortality and to say that there will come a time when our role in our human history will end. Anna and Simeon seem to recognise this with, with great faith. Uh, as I say, for Simeon, it's a matter of, of recognising that his life is at its end, not a, a life ended prematurely, but a life that is ended with a sense of fulfilment and completion. Of course, at the moment, we've had the experience of many lives being lost, which haven't felt completed and fulfilled. People dying, as it were, before their time. But perhaps Simeon and Anna, both long lived, can remind us that, in fact, time is under God's dispensation. And whether our lives are long or short, we're ultimately drawn to God. And um, the life that we have is used to his glory. It's something which is always, in a sense, fulfilled, however truncated it may seem to be. It's always tragic when a life is cut short, but we can still see God at work in the, in the years, indeed even the months of a short life, um, and often very powerfully so. I think there's also, and this perhaps enables them to have this, this faith and this sense of acceptance, um, there's, a, there's a sort of consistency of being in the way that each of them live their lives. They don't just sort of pop into the temple to pray off, on the off chance and find Jesus there. This is part of the habit of their devotion, um, their daily living 
um, their religious um, uh, way of life, their, their, their form of life. We saw that Simeon is described as, as righteous and, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, this isn't something that just happens in a moment. This is something which is born out of a life of faithful prayer, um, of reading the scriptures, of listening to God. And in listening to God, he's, he's realised um, this promise about the Messiah. And Anna, in those wonderful terms, she's always at the temple, uh, always hanging around, um, a familiar figure there. Um, that is, again, part of the discipline of her life, to be there, as it were, in the presence of God, open, listening and receptive. It's that receptiveness which I think helps us deal with even the most difficult situations, such as the one we have today. It's a waiting on God's will so that we may not understand what's going on around us, but an openness that God speaks to us as well as us crying out to him with our heartfelt prayers. And sometimes we need the silence and the stillness that was no doubt part of the lives of Anna and Simeon. We need that time to listen to God as well and to begin to fathom a, a little bit something of his activity and his will at work. As regards Anna, I think there's another dimension which speaks very much to us today, and that is the sense of loss that she must have experienced. She'd been married seven years, all too short a time. And given the, the age of marriage uh, in, in that era, she would have been perhaps in her early 20s when she was widowed. And she has these long years, potentially very lonely years, very difficult years. She turns that loss to good. I'm sure um, we shouldn't diminish the, the sense of loss that would have been there throughout her life. Um, it would have been something that she carried with her. But she managed to use her life creatively and not allow that loss to bring her life to a full stop. So there's a creativity in the way that she uses her bereavement to offer her life back to God. A very difficult and challenging thing, but it's something that clearly she has done over these long years. As a woman who'd, who'd been widowed young, um, in a society that was very sort of male-focused, male-orientated, she would also have been very vulnerable. And um, we can imagine that she's overcome many trials, many challenges over the years, and faced those in a way that has enabled her to live a life of worship and dignity over, over the ensuing years. So her commitment to God is long-term. It's thought out, prayed out, lived out. And while she may have been carrying, as I say, the pain of bereavement all that time, yet she is able to live out her life fruitfully uh, in worshipping God and in allowing him to use her, really, in that two-way relationship that comes from prayer and contemplation. I think we're all very conscious um, at the moment of the mystery of loss and pain and suffering of, of death and indeed the fragility of life, that sense in which lives which would appear to be normally healthy can be struck down by this virus. It's very un unnerving, it's very difficult to live with. But that's really the invitation that Anna and Simeon give us, is to live with it and to find God even in the darkest circumstances. To recognise with faith that God works in and through and indeed beyond these circumstances uh, and that holding fast to God um, gives us a way to find our journey onwards through these difficulties. I'm always fond of saying that I, I, I don't think our religious faith is just a prop. You know, some, some critics of religious belief will say, oh, it's just a crutch, it's just a prop to get you through the hard times of life. I'm not sure I'd want to see religious faith like that, particularly at a time like this, this pandemic. What we have is certainly something which supports us, but which always challenges us. We don't have any special answers to the mystery of the suffering that's going on now. We, don't, we can't bypass the pain uh, and the death and the sadness of so many people. We're living in that as much as people who perhaps have no faith. But our faith does at least give us a, a type of roadmap to live with the tensions, live with the challenges, live with the pain. And I'm encouraged by the way in which Anna did that, and in the end found the joy 
of holding the Christ child. To hold him is, is really quite something. And we are able to hold him in prayer and be held by him in return. And as for Simeon, well, he recognises that this is salvation being outpoured in the midst of all that was going on in his life too. And that's wonderful. He has that insight that Jesus is a sign, a sign of God's grace. However dark times are, God gives us those signs. He even actually warns Mary that a sword will pierce her soul too. It's almost as though he's reminding us of that uh, way in which uh, Mary and Jesus' lives are, are so intimately bound as, as mother and son. And the devotion we have to Our Lady really stems from the understanding of people like Simeon, that what happened to Christ, in a sense, happened to her in her heart and soul. And we know how it goes with the journey Christ himself made, that the child grows to the adult who experiences so much suffering and pain, and yet finds in his father both the solace and the impetus to live through and to conquer death. I hope those things can be of some comfort to us in these very challenging times. I hope they can remind us that we go through these times not with an absent God, but with a God who presents himself to us now and day by day. And so may God bless you this candle mass and in the coming months.